Welcome to Viki, the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. We are pleased to, uh, to welcome you today because it's a special day. We're going to delve into the situation in uh, Venezuela and see how we can understand what is going on and what could be the way out of this tension between the U.S., constant tension, I should say, between the U.S. and Venezuela. To talk about it, we'll uh, joined by uh, Peter Lakowski, who you might have heard him on this topic. He's a peace activist, he's a community member whom we uh, cherish very much, <laughs> and he's going to share with us you know, his insights about like, the situation in Venezuela. Joining us also is uh, Sandy Bell, the usual suspect, Sandy, the president of Vicky, is here also, but also as a, you know, as an historian who knows about what was going on, what is going on in this region. So, without any uh, uh, further ado, we'll uh, pass the, the torch to Peter for a keynote speech. That's how we, <laughs> that's how we call it, a uh, keynote speech. Just uh, give us, you know an idea of what's going on, and then from there we'll open the, the floor to good discussion. Could, could I just say a few words about why I think that this is such an important topic? And that is for a very long time, the United States has sought to dominate uh, Latin America. So that has always been my interest. Why is the United States, how did that happen that the United States has always felt that it must control La all of Latin America for our own interest? So my interest has always been trying to change our government's policy toward nations in Latin America that want to go their own way. My interest began with an interest in Cuba when the Cuban Revolution happened in 1959. Um, it was strengthened by other left-wing movements in Latin America. And when they take control or when they win, it always is a problem for my own government. So while uh, um, Peter will talk tonight about the government of Venezuela, how it happened, and the revolutionary movements that occurred in Venezuela, I, always, I want to also ask Peter in the end, what did all that mean? And why, why did it pose in the government of the United States? What was the big deal about Venezuela that caused it to develop such a hostile attitude. So we'll be covering, I think, I hope, two things. One is what's going on in Venezuela, including the recent election in Venezuela. And also, why is the United States so hostile to Venezuela? So welcome. I'm so happy to see you, Peter. He's a neighbor of mine in Ward 1. Um, he has been a member of the city council. He's also a public school teacher, now retired, correct? Right. So Peter has become an expert on the subject of Venezuela, has been there many, many times, and is right up to date on what's happening there. So I'm so happy to see you here. Good. Thank you. Yeah, um, I want to start with a brief uh, synopsis of some Venezuelan history that I think is important to really understand the whole situation. Uh, and I'm going to start around the 1980s, when Venezuela was in a really unsustainable state. Um, the oil, it's, it's a, the oil curse, as they say, uh, that the amount of money flowing in from uh, from the oil had caused uh, agriculture essentially to collapse, just as it NAFTA did in, in Mexico. When uh, when there's a lot of money uh, flowing into a country, it's possible there's, there's an opportunity for uh, local folks to take over the grain distribution business, the food business, sell off um, food that's been bought on, at, at a discount from subsidized agriculture in, in the United States, and basically destroy the local uh, agricultural uh, economy by underselling local grain. The result is people flow from the countryside into the cities, the cities get ballooned out, huge amount of poverty is involved, and that happened during the, the whole process. It happened all through the, the 20th century. We're finally getting, re reaching a really un unbelievable 
levels of inequality and also poverty and misery in the hills surrounding not just not, not just Caracas but all the cities and but especially Caracas that, that has about a, a very large proportion of the population of Venezuela. Um, and the, the way it was set up at that point was there was an it was an oligarchy, Frank oligarchy, um, and the oligarchy had political parties that were kind of like Democrats and Republicans, uh, but they were they had it even more systematic. They rigged, rigged things up so that it was so they basically just made a deal between the the, the, the two major parties, Cope and, and uh, Democratic Action, um, that they would just trade the presidency from year to year and that everything would be fine because nothing would really change. It would just be a little difference emphasis and personnel. Um, and that's the way it worked. So it was run by an oligarchy that consisted of, um, on the one hand, the, the oil company. And that was that's a big thing in Venezuela because it's a, it's a pretty big industry. That would be the management, of course, um, and also the union. It was, they, the, they had basically break things up so that, I mean, when you're running an oil industry, you need a lot of skilled workers. They, they, they were unionized. They were basically a labor aristocracy. Um, and between them, uh, they ran uh, the oil company. And the, they were joined in the oligarchy by big business. Uh, the food importers, for one, and people who imported all kinds of other things, too. Never mind buying stuff. We have money. We can just buy it and bring it in. Nobody here is going to compete with it. Everything that was being consumed in Venezuela was being imported. Uh, the oil, but never mind, because the balance of payments is fine. The oil is flowing in. And the oligarchy is skimming all the cream off, living in an incredibly uh, lavish, uh, opulent lifestyle. Um, the, the, the Venezuelans were notorious for the, for the, uh, the, the beauty contests, for example. The kind of ostentatious, uh, well, the, the upper class girls would go to finishing schools. They had these contests. It was like a national contest. The winner of the Miss Venezuela contest, they'd name the oil tankers after her. They, uh, <laughs> that's really true. And they, um, in the, uh, when Cheryl and I happened to stay in a neighborhood, uh, in a very upper class neighborhood for a little while, and we got to really see what it was like. The, for one thing, beautiful, you know, lots of big houses and stuff, but the main, the, the, the subway station, it was like a, I've never seen a subway station like it. In the old days, there was a, um, well, it's still there, there um, you, as you walk down into the subway, there was this broad, expanse of like molded concrete and stuff that water was running down and it was trickling and gurgling like a mountain stream like a cascade it was wonderful you'd come out of the hot sun and you'd walk into this sub classy subway station in the plaza francia which is like the heart of of the upper class it's, it's where they staged their big demonstrations later on um, and it was just wonderful that was in 2005 by 2008, that was over. It's not happening. I ask you something, Peter. So I don't know if most Americans know that Venezuela is an oil producer, correct? Oh, well, yes, that's it. Yeah. Like the largest uh, no, oil the reserve in the world. Yeah, I think sure. at least one of the fourth. What? I, I don't know where, it's, where it ranks, but right. th there are immense oil deposits uh, around Lake Maracaibo, and there are also some at the other end of the country, too, uh, around Trinidad and so on. But um, yeah, in Lake Maracaibo, uh, the, the city of Maracaibo is the second city, very much influenced by Americans because, of course, oil, oil people from America came there with the corporations. And um, anyway, I, that, that was where the oil was coming from. And that was, that was started in the 30s. It was discovered. And then, of course, the whole oil boom and the whole world started all, all after the Second World War, especially. Um, so anyway, the, the, the upper class was doing very, very well. The other people, the rest of the people, which is most of them, of course, were not doing very well. And the, the, the tension grew and grew and grew until in 1989, in February, there was an explosion. It's called the Caracaso. 
I'm cut it, uh, the Oslo is just a suffix, but it's basically what happened in Car Caracas. Um, it was a little town, sort of a, sort of a suburb. Uh, somebody, a, a riot started. Somebody broke the windows in the store and started looting the store. It was like a spark in a tinderbox. The whole city of Caracas just blew up. Throughout the city, people come down, came down and took what they really felt like this had all been stolen from them, in, in a sense. There was a real sense of resentment and that, that these people living this luxury and luxurious life, these shops full of wonderful appliances and big TVs and everything, and that, you know, that was, the injustice was just too much. And, and poverty, and here was a chance. The response was horrendous. Uh, the government called out the army and they ordered uh, them to shoot on sight. It was a curfew and they just started shooting. Um, about, they, well, they asked people to estimate 3,000 dead and just countless wounded, but nobody really knows because they just shoveled the corpses into big pits and, and you, but there, after that, it was so bad and it was so scary to have that happen that people were pretty, pretty frightened and they didn't want to talk about it too much. But they didn't get over the anger, obviously. And that, uh, it, a few years later, 1992, an obscure, uh, someone never been heard of before, a, a, a lieutenant colonel named Chavez uh, who suddenly appeared on the scene. He was and, in the army? Pardon me? In the army? Lieutenant colonel in the army, a guy who had been raised um, in the basically in a dirt with, by his grandmother and mother in a place, a house with a dirt floor. His grandmother was supporting the family by picking fruit off the trees and making confections and peddling them. Whatever you could do it was in a, in, a, in a small town on the edge of the Great Plains, the Llanos. Um, anyway, he went to, went to uh, he managed to get into the, uh, the academy. Uh, long story, a very interesting one. He wanted to be, he was an excellent pitcher, a left-handed pitcher, um, and he wanted to get into the big leagues, and he was also very bright. So even though he was poor, he managed to pass the tests, and he was a good athlete, and they let him in the, the academy. And as a cadet, there he was in Caracas after coming in from way out in the boonies. It was like wide-eyed walking around and seeing what was really going on. And also it was a relative of his father's so that he could kind of filled him in on what's really going on here. And it wasn't long before he gave up on baseball and thought, we're going to fix this somehow. And he basically made it. He was only like in his early 20s, but he just buckled down. And along with a lot of other officers, he uh, was very much interested in what had happened in, in Panama and in Peru with Velasco, a couple of military people who had taken over the government and really did progressive things, uh, unlike a lot of other military people who've taken over governments and just massacred people and oppressed them. But these folks, these two, had, were real models of what, a, what an army coup could result in if it was carried out by the right people for the right reasons. So, but both of them, for in various ways, were brought down, or one was died in a, a in an airplane accident, or hell, I forget. I guess it was an airplane. Anyway, he died for the air, air crash. Um, but the, the uh, office, some of the people in, uh, well, people all over in militaries in Latin America were taking note, and um, Chavez started talking to people. And he, uh, he went, there was all sorts of stories about what he, it's a long story, it's fascinating tales about how he managed to pull, to pull together um, a sort of a cadre of officers who felt the same way. But you have to remember, of course, this was like really dangerous. I mean, if you're trying to organize a coup, you really can't trust, um, you have to be really careful about who you trust and how you do it. And uh, they, they, they were always sort of wondering about him, the higher ups, and they kept trying to keep an eye on him and so on. But they, uh, in fact, for one, at one point, they sent him way out into the countryside to uh, uh, was a, the, the, the job of the army in those days was to repress the guerrilla fighters, which there was plenty of them. We were trying to do what Cha Che and, and Fidel had done in Cuba. They were out in the, in the, in the countryside, and the army was chasing them. Uh, well, he was sent to a place where the problem was the indigenous people. 
And uh, he was the kind of guy who would, he went out to see them. Well, first he arrived, he went out with his uniform and a few soldiers, and he got pretty close to the community, and there was a shower of arrows. And I was like, oh, <laughs> they were not happy with us. He went back. Next day, he came back alone in civilian clothes. Said, hey, hey, everybody, I want to talk. Went and talked, made friends with people pretty soon. Got along really well. <laughs> he was starting to organize the community and so Anyway, eventually he came, he was at, he did that sort of thing through, they couldn't really get rid of him, but he managed to do a nice job out in the countryside. He came back and eventually he was back in, in, in uh, in Caracas, and he ended up then being uh, taken in. He was so bright uh, that he was in a, he was teaching cadets, and he started teaching them about Bolivar and about Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar. Pardon me. Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar, the great liberator who who was born in Caracas and and basically a, a, a great national hero in, in Venezuela. Every town, every town has a statue of Bolivar. That they joke about it, but it's really true that there's a, he's on a horse in, in Caracas. But when you go to the smaller and smaller towns, well, maybe he's just standing there. And then sometimes it's just a little bitty but a statue, but there's always a, some kind of a statue in the same. We will have to see Martin in Cuba. Yeah, it, but, it's, but what's important to know is that Simon Bolivar is not very well known in the United States. No, no. But he liberated almost all, all of South yeah. America yeah. from Spain. Yeah, we did, and San Martin right. was working from the other direction. But right. yeah, anyway, um, so Bolivar, uh, talking about Bolivar is, is, uh, is like, Talking about a revolutionary, and there's another one, Samora, that nobody's ever heard of here, but he's quite well known there. At the same time that we were fighting the civil war, Samora was fighting a peasant war to, and liberated the peasants from uh, sort of a semi-feudalism that they were living in. Um, and you know, he was he finally was killed, but you know, he left a, left a mark. Anyway, so Chavez was doing that, and he managed to organize all of those, those folks. And in uh, 1992, he staged a coup. He and his, his, of course, his fellow officers, but he was basically the leader. And um, a variety of things went wrong. When you pull off a coup like this, you know, with a minority of people in secret, it doesn't always go well, and it didn't. And once it was obvious that it was going to collapse, he said he got in touch. They had telephone communication. He got in touch with the government and said, look, I'll, I'll call it all off and I'll have everybody surrender. Before, but there's no reason to shed a lot of blood here. Let's just, I can see it's over. But I, I'll do that, but only on one condition. That is if I have to make a brief statement on the radio uh, or television. I, I don't remember, actually. I think it was television, come and think of it. Anyway, um, they allowed him, uh, after negotiating, he, he said, no, no, no editing ahead of time. I, just want to say what I'm going to say. And he made a short statement, and he basically said, we tried to do something that I think most people wanted us to do, uh, you know, and, but um, we tried, we have failed, and I take responsibility for that, uh, but we, uh, for now. And the phrase, the word, the two words, for now, por ahora, were the ones that people fixed on. Because this, in other words, we're not done, you know, we may have failed, but it's going to happen. And there were a couple of other coups that didn't last as long and didn't create the same kind of stir as Chavez was did. But Chavez ended up in jail, but a national hero, believe it or not. And people were so happy to see somebody try to do something that um, they, uh, people started flocking to his jail, to, to the jail. Famous intellectuals, uh, organizers of all sorts were coming to visit, to talk to him, see what he had to say. And he go, well, you know, he was learning too. I mean, he just really made a lot of connections. Among them was a young fellow who was organizing bus drivers. Um, he was a bus driver and he was organizing, but he was in like 18 or so, I forgot exactly, Nicolas Maduro. Um, and he came and hung around and really, you know, became a very close confidant of Chavez and also one of his most useful and helpful pupils and, you know, he's quite a bit younger, uh, but really Chavez began to really rely on him. He later became the secretary of, uh, well, what we would call the, the, sec the, uh, the foreign secretary. Um, and learned a great deal. He was all over the world with Chavez and so on and on his own. 
Um, and eventually, of course, as we know, Nicolas Maduro's president now, after Charles, because he was the vice president when Charles Chavez died. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, the first thing that Chavez did after being elected by uh, a, a very Oh, I, I'm skipping here. He, uh, the, the coup went on. He was a national hero, but there he was in jail. Uh, but two years later, a guy named Rafael Cal, uh, um, Cal, uh, Caldera uh, was running for president, and he uh, uh, made a campaign promise that he would let Chavez out of jail. Uh, in fact, he, and that was helped him get elected, actually. Um, so it's un unusual, but that was Venezuela's politics. Uh, so they did let him out, and after a while, I mean, given all the connections that Chavez had made, he didn't have any money, but he and a couple of pals got a, bought a truck with a pla you know, like a platform truck that they could set up, and they started barnstorming all over the country, speaking and so forth, as there were some Sometimes they slept under the truck when it was raining. It was like a lot of, it was a real shoestring thing, but he, um, and you know, it was just like an obscure candidate. But it's a fascinating tale, which I won't try to resume. At, by the time it was over, he won the election hands down with a really solid majority. And I mean, how he got there, like I say, it, it was a fascinating tale of the, the opposition just just stumbling all over themselves. But they were really so discredited by that time in the eyes of the public that when you look back at it, it was anybody could have won as long as they weren't associated with the old regime. So there he was in office, and he had made a promise that they wanted and he, there should be a new constitution. So they held an election. Should there be a new constitution? For 80, I think it was 88% voted yes, if you can believe it. That's how disgusted people were with the old system. So um, there he was with, uh, okay, now we're going to have a constitution, a constitutional convention. And well, 88% maybe have wanted it, but 12% didn't, and they were the real hardcore conservatives, so they weren't going to be involved in writing a constitution. Like, that's just a bunch of nonsense. Who needs one? Uh, but people, all the other people, like the, the people to, who really did want a new order, uh, and leftists, uh, organizers from um, feminists, uh, 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 indigenous people, all kinds of people who didn't, hadn't really had much of a say in things, came out and got themselves elected as, as representatives. It was several hundred people, actually. It was a huge, what, 500? I don't remember the number, but a lot, a lot of people. Uh, and they wrote a new constitution. And the new constitution is, is, remains to, to, to this time the most progressive constitution on the planet. Uh, and one of the interesting things was that it guaranteed rights, like you have a right to a job. Is, is, you don't you don't have to thank anybody for it. You have a right to a job. You have a right to health care. You have a right to a house. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be, you know, prove your wealth. If you're a human being, you have a right to a decent life. And that's written in the Constitution, and all the provisions try to make that you know, set up to, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to sue the government if they don't give you a house. It's aspirational, but it's intentional that that be the, the way we're going from here on out. Um, and it was quite a long thing. It was basically this, a, 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 a democratic constitution of the sort that we're familiar with, you know, people voting and so on, uh, a strong presidency, which is common, and that wasn't that different from other Latin American mm -hmm. constitutions, except for some of the guarantees and the whole attitude of uh, a, a, new kind of, uh, a new kind of attitude toward the population that they're in charge. Uh, naturally, uh, that didn't go over quite as big with people, but it did pass with a 71% uh, uh, vote. I mean, so it was a good, solid majority voted that in. Um, and then they had to reelect Chavez again because under the new constitution, he was going to be ran for president again. Well, again, I don't have the number, but he was pretty well swept into office. Um, and then um, very shortly after that, there was a terrible disaster, one of the most horrifying disasters you can imagine, where whole hillsides. I, I, so it was taken by a friend who has actually seen it, um, and it was 
uh, along the seacoast, there's a big, big mountain range and it's largely mud. And people had built houses up there, the mm. poor people, on these unstable, and this and all over the country, or all around Caracas especially, on uh, very unsteady unst unst land. And it all started sliding, and pretty mm -hmm. soon it turned to a river of mud. And thousands of people were swept out to sea, along with their houses and everything they, that was there, just swept out to sea. And, or down into the valleys and buried in mud. It was a terrible thing, and Chavez handled it wonderfully. He called out the army, for one thing, which was really unheard of. The army was there to repress people, not to help them. But he turned that around, and he just like made him do it. Some of the generals like, like well, puff, 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 but you know, it was like, no, get on the job, do it. And so they, he had already had some, had been preparing them for that. There was a plan Bolivar he had put in place, but this was really a test, and that is, it worked. It, it, it was it was a terrible situation, but people really were felt like the government finally was going to do something for them and not just say, oh, isn't that, let's all pray, our hearts and minds, our hearts and, you know, like they say here, but we're not going to do anything. Well, this is the guy who's going to do things. And then, okay, so that was, and once they got that cleaned up, then there was a question of, well, now, how about, let's, there's this gusher of money coming in from the oil, can't we take that instead of sending it to the East End, that fancy neighborhood with the, with the, that I was talking about before, where all these rich people are just going to squander it on big old time cars with big fins in those days, and you know. But it, it, they, how do we turn that money to the to the people? Well, Chavez soon find out, found out he ran into what we now call what the the term wasn't invented yet, but it was it was the same thing. It was the deep state. Deep state. He, he had a, a, a government that had been completely set up to not to do what he wanted to do, but to send all his wealth in one direction and never mind about the people. We just keep them in prison. And we have a police force to take care of them, you know, and, a, and an army if they really get serious. Uh, well, he, this was what he had to work with, and they were just digging in their heels. It was really hard to get anything done through the ministries. And so he set up a whole different thing. It made me think of what Bernie did in, in Burlington when uh, when he set up the mayor's council on this and the mayor's council on when that. When you were on city council? Well, yeah, during the days when Bernie was elected and the city council just wouldn't wouldn't even give him the time. They wouldn't even talk to him. They just tried to shut him up and ignore him. And so he just had to use city hall. And a lot of volunteers came out of the woodwork and went to work and they founded these things. Well, Chavez started something called the mission, so Misiones. And there it's, first of all, one of the most famous is Barrio Adentro, where um, he was sending ships full of oil by that time to Cuba and other places at a total discount. Cuba sent hundreds and then thousands, really, of doctors, sports trainers, um, nurses, techni oh, God, very important, uh, technicians, uh, um, agricultural technicians. Um, all kinds of experts like that, but especially the Barrio Adentro. Doctors who went in and lived in the barrios weren't, because doctors in Venezuela were for rich people, and rich people didn't go into the barrio. They were afraid to, for one thing, with, with some reason, of course. Um, but they just, there was no money to be made, so like, why should they do that? I mean, there's no money to be made. What's your problem? Like? Uh, well, this, these doctors went and lived there, and uh, at first they'd have, they would often just stay in somebody's house till they could build them a, a consultory or, or a, like an office where they could come be seen. And I remember going to, trying to visit with them. You had to go there uh, in the morning to see if you wanted to talk to one because they were out doing house calls in the afternoon. It was a Cuban model of really going out and really seriously helping people. And it's not about making money, but delivering health care. And it was very successful and hugely alike. But there was more than so much more. There was a, the Mission Robinson, named after Bolivar's uh, teacher. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> that was literacy. And again, Cubans mm -hmm. came through with a lot of materials. Um, and the whole country by 2005, I remember it was well, when I was first there, they, the, um, <clears throat> they had been declared by UNESCO to be an Ill, uh, illiteracy-free country. Unlike the US. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, they're way ahead of the U.S. And this was done, uh, the, the illiteracy was no small matter. There was massive illiteracy in the countryside, and, and even in the barrios, there were plenty of people who had never got near a school. Um, but uh, that another thing that was like, there were so many missions. I remember people of, uh, in 2005 going, people being so proud of being part of Mis Misión Ribas, well, Ribas, the other hero, um, at where you would get your GED, because uh, they, a lot of people did have some schooling, but really pretty sketchy. And people wanted to get what we would, you know, the uh, high school equivalent. And Sucre, which was college prep, getting into the universities was not easy if you came from a high school that that was just barely worth the name of a high school. You know, it was like like a teacher with a hundred students and so on. Um, but the, they there's a lot of money to that. Money for um, oh yes, identidad. Um, a Misión Identidad. In Venezuela, everybody has a cédula, they call it. It's like it's, it's like we all have a social security number, but it's, it's not secret or anything. If you're going to open a bank account, if you're going to do anything, really, that, like social security, but even more, um, you have to have a cédula. I remember one day I would use a credit card, and they'd say, well, your cédula, por favor, and I would, well, I don't have a cédula, I'm an American. Well, use your passport number but you have to write down on a pack. But all the Venezuelans had to write their cédula down, their, their number, their official number that was, well, but a lot of people didn't have one. It, I mean, in fact, the vast majority of people didn't have them. And they, so they, the government just sort of put people on the books as real live citizens who could, from here on, vote for one thing, which was a big thing by then, um, and, and I'll do all the other things that you that you need an identity for. Um, and I remember seeing people in 2005, there were booths set up. There'd be like a, just a, a little canopy and a tent maybe and a card table, then people with computers or whatever, and long lines, people waiting to get their cedula. It was just like, it was a mass thing uh, out, out in the streets in the, in the, under the sun. Um, there was a, a, a Misión Zamora, where they were organizing the peasants, um, uh, one for miners. And, uh, the, uh, Misión Mercal um, was for food, subsidized food, half-priced food that the government put little, in, especially in small towns and, and in the barrios where it was hard to, because like Venezuela is in many ways very developed. There were super, they have supermarkets and everything, but um, uh, they were high prices, packaged food, imported food, cost a lot. Mission Mercant went out in the countryside, got food from farmers as much as possible. If it was imported, okay, just don't make any money on it. And they have, you, everywhere you go, you see big ones, small ones, out in the countryside, stores would say Mission Mercal. And in there you could go and you could get basic food at a decent, at, at least a reasonable price. If you, it, it, what you could, one that I really love was Mission Milagro, uh, Mission Miracle, and that was where um, the um, every day a plane would leave from Venezuela full of people. There would be pairs of people. One would need a cataract operation, and the other would be a person like well, a spouse or a mother or sister or whatever who would go along with them as a, somebody to help them. You know, kind of because their eyes would be out of commission for a while. So they go to Cuba, they'd have the, the, the one person would get their uh, cataracts fixed and they would get a complete checkup and the other person who came along would also get a complete checkup and medicine and treatment if they needed it and then they'd be on the next plane back after they were ready, you know, recovered. But meanwhile, another plane, every day a plane would come with a load of people and they'd all get the, their eyes taken care of. And this was like, you can imagine how much this was appreciated um, by, um, by, the, by people who never, you know, which there was so many people who thought they'd never see again. And it was just a simple operation that basically took on overnight. So, well, Goldman Cottos was a job training thing. A um, whole lot of that, missions. They worked to bypass the bureaucracy, and they really worked. Um, so, uh, but uh, things were going along great in many ways, but the opposition from the, um, 
former, from the, well, not former, the oligarchy was still very much in control of, of the economy, the country, of course. I mean, nobody was, they're, they're, they were, they, they still had, they had a lot of power. And there were plenty of them around. And they began organizing marches, hoping that they could get rid of Chavez, because it didn't take more than a couple of, I mean, at first there was a lot of hope that, well, you know, he's like a lot of these generals, he talks, talks big, but pretty soon we'll just go out and put our arm around his shoulder and send it, it must explain the real world, real world here, and, and pretty soon we'll have him on our side and he'll be a puppet, but it didn't work out that way. It took, like, almost no time at all before they realized that was not gonna work. Um, and they started going into uh, coup mood, mode. But and what was uh, the attitude of the U.S. at that point? Well, at that point, the United States was, was watching all this with concern. Mm. And naturally, they were, um, they were start, they, right away, they started a propaganda campaign about, uh, about uh, anti-Chavez pro pro propaganda, and also covering the, the demonstrations, because the uh, right wings could turn out a lot of people in Caracas, and they did. Uh, they had big, big demonstrations, uh, thousands. Um, however, uh, by that time, the, the Chavistas, the, the poor people and the, and, and the working people, um, they also had demonstrations that were really <laughs> bigger, actually. But the one, the demonstrations of the opposition were the ones that you'd see about in the New York Times or hear about on NPR. I remember listening to the stories about that on NPR, actually. Um, and uh, uh, big demonstrations of, thousands, like I say, thousands. Um, finally, things came to a, 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 a head, and a coup was staged. Um, the, uh, uh, did it was, was the coup financially supported by the U.S.? Uh, I don't believe they needed it. Frankly, mm -hmm. there was uh, there were plenty. They had plenty of money, um, and the, the it was it, but it was certainly coordinated with the with the embassy, um, and um, the uh, uh, the the idea was that finally the what the culmination of it was a huge march. The plan being to march on, on Miraflores Palace and and just sort of march in and, right. and and take over, you know, and have so many people that there wouldn't be any point in the palace guard, uh, you know, mm -hmm. resisting you physically or anything because there'd be a mess. But it had to work out. Uh, it, that on that day, uh, not to su anyone's surprise, there was also a very large uh, contingent from the other side, from the Chavistas, surrounding the palace and waiting for them. Um, they, uh, what happened then was um, the, both the Chavistas were there, the, the parade came, got pretty close, and then things are pretty fuzzy, but Snipers began shooting people on both sides. People were being shot from, it turned out from above. Well, later on it turned out, of course, that that had all been planned. It was all part of the thing. The snipers were in a high building and right, right near there was a, a place called Puente Jaguno. Like, were, the, were the snipers sent from the right? Uh, that's what I'm about to yeah. explain. Yes, they were definitely. Actually, uh, they they finally got away. Uh, it was it was a great deal of confusion happened, as you can imagine. All of a sudden, people were being shot from uh, uh, who knows where. Nobody knew where this was coming from at first, except that the bullets all seemed to be coming down and hitting people on the head. It was awful. Um, and uh, the, uh, they got away finally, the snipers did. People heard them talking a language that they didn't understand and it was very much suspected they, they were Israeli, but it was Israeli? never proven because they did get away. And uh, it was not proven. Wow. Uh, it was just suspected. Um, but they were definitely speaking some kind of foreign language. Not and, English. Uh, yeah, no, they Venezuelans. Yeah, right. they right. They've heard English before. And, um, and so, wait a minute, Cheryl. Sure. Give us some years. Yeah. Oh, this uh, this this was uh, actually uh, April 11th, uh, uh, 2002, and uh, so there was Chavez in the palace, surrounded by um, uh, all of this going on, really. Um, 
let me try to get uh, uh, get it organized in my head here. Yes, so there was uh, an army contingent with some tanks were coming. Um, there was a long story about why the, the rest of the army was all tied up in the, the they, put, they diverted traffic in such a way that the rest of the army couldn't get out of the local fort, Fort de Tayuno, at Tayuna, and, and then, so they, they basically the coup worked. Uh, Chavez was isolated in the palace, surrounded by um, by the military, and in the middle of the night they were being threatened by to be bombed by the air force because the air force was most much a right wing, much more right wing than, than the army, um, and uh, so Chavez was taken out, kidnapped essentially. Um, long lots of confusion, and he ended up on an island offshore. Um, but, and the next day, they were already, the bourgeoisie showed up in the palace. They had a big celebration, big congratulations, all back slapping, wow, we finally did it. And this is all recorded because at the time, um, at the, at the, a movie was made out of it actually. It's yeah. called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Right. It was actually one of the things that inspired me to go to Venezuela when I saw that. I had to go and see more. Um, but the, uh, what happened was that the, uh, uh, the guy who was the, 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 the official photographer, well, every president has a photographer and videographer, takes, you know, does the documentary, would shake hands with the president of another country and stuff. Well, they just, he just kept doing his job. And it was a very fascinating because there he was, was the people who thought they were going to die, actually. If they uh, they were expecting a, a bomb strike, it was very dramatic. The, the footage that he took of people just like uh, saying goodbye for the last time. But finally, Chavez said, "Wait a minute, this is you know, we don't have to die. I'll just give up." And they did. He, he surrendered, and they took him off. Okay. Um, but the next day, they were they they abolished the constitution that had been passed by this great majority. They just like. Null and void, and uh, every, the government will all be uh, dissolved now. We're going to go back to the old constitution, and they started grabbing, uh, sending mobs to to grab uh, uh, known chavistas, beating them up and arresting them, and they were all going to be. It was going to be another bloodbath. It looked like after like after Pinochet or any of them, but uh, it didn't work out that way. All, I remember a friend uh, had, uh, that was explaining to me, she was there actually, uh, she'd been around and she was right in the middle of it. She said that it looked like ants coming down the hill, you know, way off in the distance, the, all the barrios, people streaming down the hillsides, coming into the city. Pretty soon, people were coming in on buses from all over the country. Um, I remember a guy in the, way up in the Andes, hundreds of miles away says, so, yeah, they, we were getting phone calls. There were soldiers that were calling calling home because cell phones were starting to come in then. And they said, they, don't, they had cell phones and they were telling us what was going on. And this guy was a guy who ran a radio station. So the clandestine radio station, uh, actually, even after Chavez was in, they were still had to worry about the local police and stuff. So, but he used his clandestine radio station and broadcast the news. All people went on buses to, to raise hell, and millions, I, nobody knows how many, of course, because nobody was, there was no way to estimate, but it was a vast, vast crowd. And the people in the Miraflores Palace, you could, the guy, the videographer, was watching big videos of them scuttling out with their aids, like looking over their shoulders, they just, it's over. They just collapsed, it completely collapsed. And the next thing you knew, they sent a helicopter, Chavez came back, it was, uh, they had, meantime, they had uh, anointed the head of the Fede Comoros, the, the, how, the uh, Businessmen's Association. They'd made him president, uh, uh, Pedro Carmona. And uh, they call him uh, uh, Pedro, uh, Pedro el Breve, Peter the Brave, the Brief, because he ruled for, for the coup lasted 47 <laughs> hours. So uh, Pedro el, el Breve. Uh, was a brief moment and uh, he had went into exile eventually. He escaped from house arrest. He broke his word 
went into exile. But uh, uh, so that was over. Peter, before we, we could we, um, and this, this is a terrific history, by the way. So Thank you. could we have a little bit of a thought maybe about what is now happening? Uh, yeah. um, I'd like to, yeah. I, I, I'm, uh, what I, I want to just, I, I want to just, I think the, the, the point of, Af what, of, of giving this, because I, I, it, it's really kind of important to, mm -hmm. to, to, to see the, 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 pro the process, the evolution of what was going on, because after this, after this coup, they um, did another thing that um, the, the, the business community went on a, on a lockout. They went on an owner's strike, a, a strike by the, by the big money. They shut down all production of everything. Everybody is laid off, uh, were, are, you know, sent home. Um, stores all closed. All the McDonald's and all the rest of it were just stopped. They sailed, the, they, the uh, oil company participated. They, they sailed the tankers offshore and defied the government. We're not shipping any oil. Shut it down. It's over. And the whole country was on lockdown. Well, not quite, because business went out as usual and up, in the, up in the hills and so forth. The, the only people who really shut down were the bourgeois, the, the ruling class. They shut their, their businesses down, but everybody else ignored them. Nevertheless, with the country on lockdown, no Nothing happening. No business. Banks closed. Everything closed. Everything that the big money controlled, which is almost everything, uh, except for small businesses, closed. So it was a huge suffering, and this went on for months and months. But finally, it just fizzled. People started ignoring the, the ruling class. They didn't want it. They couldn't live with it. After a while, they started sneaking in. The, McDonald's was selling hamburgers out the back door. You know, there was a lot of stories like that about how uh, the rich people just kind of gave up. And, but there was a wrecked country. When I got there in 2005, I saw a country that was, it, it was a disaster. Uh, there were people begging all over the place. And the unbelievable level of poverty in the whole streets were completely filled from sidewalk to sidewalk. All the street, there was like a, a lane down the middle for motorcycles. All the rest of it was people peddling stuff on the streets because there was no work to be had. It, it was a disaster. Beggars all over the place. It was, it was really awful what they had done to the people to make them suffer, hoping that they would rise up against Chavez, and they didn't. They just hung in there until it was over. Were there and, any sanctions? Mm -hmm. from, there weren't from any from sanctions yet. This was a, this was a self-inflicted thing. This was done in, in 2003, up to early 2003. But that was, sanctions were coming. Mm. But this, what this did was this really showed Chavez that something had to be done that he was never going to be able to work with these people, that they were never going to quit. They were going to just keep trying to bring them down. Mm -hmm. If they had to use violence, if they had to use trickery, whatever they were going to use, they were going to bring them down. But he had to set up something new. And he started, he came to the conclusion that the only answer is some kind of socialism. We're not going to be able to do this with this system the way it is. It's got to be much more radical than that. But he was not unaware of the problems of what had been 20th century socialism. I mean, obviously, you don't want to re reduplicate what, the, what they were doing in, in Russia or Yugoslavia or any of those countries. Or Cuba. Had collapsed. Or Cuba, for that matter, even though he was close with, with, with mm -hmm. Fidel and mm -hmm. admired him greatly. But the system was much more based on, a, on, a, on an old 20th century model that was not working. And so Chavez got together with a whole in people who really understood, for one thing, some really uh, brilliant intellectuals who really had made some careful analysis of what, what went wrong with 20th century socialism. And uh, along with a lot of the indigenous, uh, uh, I want to say indigenous, I don't mean in the sense of Native Americans, but um, local uh, 
there were communists, there were socialists who were organizing in the barrios too, mm. all this time, and out in the countryside, all those guerrillas had been gave up finally on the on the Foucault idea of Chavez, of Chavez and Che. That was never going to work, and they knew finally they realized they that was. Down, that, but they moved uh, up to have have a, a rural uprising. But they moved into the cities along with all the people who used to live in the countryside and started organizing there. So there was a real base of a real some real knowledge about how to how to organize people at, at the grassroots level. And that's when a whole new thing started. They started talking, uh, some which has already been in, enshrined in many ways in the Constitution, that they wanted a society that was protagonist, where the people were their ideas would be private, it, uh, where the ideas of the, how to build things in the future were going to come from the people and not from above. It was going to be from below. And participatory. They wanted everybody involved. They wanted people. They didn't want to have people just come out and vote once in a while. And then uh, they didn't want to reduplicate our system, for example, of, of what, what we call democracy. They could see it's a sham, that it's not democratic. And it's sort of obvious if you're looking at the United States from outside that, that, that to call this really democracy is just a joke. That, that, you know, that it's, it, it's another thing entirely. And so, uh, that, and they, but they did finally come up with some general principles of what they wanted. Then the basic idea was social ownership on the one hand. Uh, that is, in other words, that, that, that all of these rich people who own all of these big factories and stuff, because all this stuff, that, and all of, also the big land and stuff, but all of this development that humanity has, it was all owned by just a few people who had nothing to do with creating it or anything like that. They were just like the sons and daughters of whoever managed to steal it from somebody else in most cases. Um, that was the property of all humanity. And that's the way we should look at it, that all of our, all of the means of production that were so, that bring us all of the goods of modern life, this wasn't made by the millionaires who own them, who quote, own that. That was made by all human beings who lived in up to now. And so, okay, social pro property is really what we're aiming at. It's not gonna happen overnight, but that's, that's the way to think about things. The other thing was uh, worker control, that we don't, Humans are very smart people and they know how to do jobs and they don't need to be bossed around if they really, if their hearts are in it. If they know they're doing it for a good reason and not just for a paycheck, they'll do it. They can organize it themselves and they don't need to be told by somebody on Wall Street how to, you know, to, how to organize their, their, their lives. And finally, uh, that production should not be for profit but for need. That the idea should be not, if you're going to do anything, you shouldn't be doing it because you're going to get rich or somebody's going to, your boss is going to get richer. It should be done because people need it to be done. That humanity uh, has needs that should be fulfilled, including not just, you know, obviously food, but, but all the other things in culture that, that we need. And that's the point of, of, of all of this effort. It, it's not just, not just richness. But that, so they, they went to work in trying to devise a new kind of a, a setup, a new, a new kind of society. And what they, they're building on, uh, actually it kind of it started in an interesting way because um, in about 2000, when I was there in 2005, I actually visited the office where they were organizing this. They went, they, they wanted to start, if you're gonna start from the bottom, you gotta start from the bottom. So they went in the barrios and people had, over the years had simply squatted. Uh, there was a lot of land, empty land. It was not very valuable because it was like on a, you know, like very steep and, and mud mostly, and so people were living all over the place. Eventually it got more stabilized because it was all plastered over with houses built, one on top of another, right next to each other, sharing walls and everything. You get a house built, and then you're, you build another one, another layer on top for your kids, and then grandchildren maybe even. You can see the process going on. I remember staying in the barrio for a while and seeing the neighbors on the, how they self-built houses. But all of this was done informally. Nobody had a deed to their house. It was all just, it was how you did it. They went in and they said, look, we'll, we'll give you guys uh, um, 
just we're from the government. We're gonna we would we, like to give you all deeds to your property, but how do we know? We have to do a survey first. Who you gotta work out who owns what and stuff. And also, we would like to help you with what you need here: sewers, streets, whatever. But you're gonna have to get before we can do anything. You have to form a community communal council and decide for yourselves. You tell us what do you need. And also, you work it out amongst yourselves where the boundary lines between the properties are. Don't bother us with, we're not gonna do that for you. You gotta figure that out. You and your neighbors, talk it over, figure it out. Well, it worked, actually, and people really took it up. And they got their deeds, and they got their services, and so forth, and it was like, yeah, this is working. So that was really one of the bases. When they called in all these experts and intellectuals, they called in people who had been working on that, too. And people had, were starting to get used to doing this. And the, so the idea that, the, I mean, it was, it was Chavez, of course, that went out to sell this. He had a program every Sunday, Allo Presidente, who was, that was the name of the program. Hello, Mr. President. And he, it, they would go on for hours. Uh, he was the kind of guy who could do it. He would go to his country, on the countryside, in different places, bring people in, talk about things, Maybe they'd all be singing songs together, but he would also then say, okay, let's get serious, they want to talk about something. And he, he explained this whole scheme that they were going to do, that people really like it resonated. The idea of first we're going to organize communal councils. When we get enough communal councils together, we're going to actually have them send people together, and they're going to send work things out at a little higher level and form communes. But we're not going to elect people as representatives to be to the commune. They're going to be voceros, which means spokespersons. What they're, they, they saw through the idea of like what we do. We elect somebody to to, to uh, an office, and then then four years they get four years, and they do whatever they think they should do. And they're very, very tempting to be bribed for bribery and all the other ills that happen with that kind of representative government. These are not representatives in that sense, at least, of representing. They're voceros, they're spokespeople, and if they don't say, if they don't repre represent in the, in the other sense, if they don't speak for us when they go to higher bodies or when they interact with the ministry of whatever it is, you know, the ministry of sewers or something, if they aren't speaking for the community, we're gonna find somebody else to do it. We're, we're gonna go along and we'll see that, that, that they, they, they say what, we're saying, what, what the community really wants. Um, and that kind of short string on people, on, on leadership, um, open books, all these, everything that's done is going to be, you're going to have open books. That anybody can go and check where the money's coming in, where the money's going out, see that none of it's going off to the side somewhere. And um, <clears throat> open decision making, of course. They try to make a con reach a consensus, but everything is done out in the open. Uh, there's not, the decisions are not being made in, in offices with, with nice paneling and stuff. Anyway, this was the this was the plan. Well, that's the reason um, I, I wanted to explain that is because that's that's the real that's the that's the, the what's going on right now. Hmm. That is can, has taken off basically. And a very large part of the population is involved in these things now. And since the recent election now, uh, in which there was uh, an awful lot of dispute and so forth, things are really, uh, it's really kind of a, in many ways a relief to have that behind us because um, the commune movement is now getting a, another, a real boost in, in many ways of uh, just building, building, a, building that new society. Um, the idea of the communes was and is that not the the, 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 the constitutional government. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, Okay, uh, the constitutional government is there. Chavez and Maduro were there when the Constitution was written. They respect the Constitution. It's what the people voted for, 71% voted for it, and, and 
there is general acceptance that the Constitution needs to be followed. The Constitution provides for all of these offices, for, provides for a modern state. But it has all of the, built into it, it has all the structures that we have here of representative government and, and ministries and so forth that have their own interests. They have all of, all of that structure is a reality. The communes are meant to be really independent of that. And the job of the government is now seen, from a Chavista point of view, is to facilitate the, the growth of those communes, to deal with them as, as essentially what's going to replace the, the bourgeois state, the, the, the state that, that was created, has, has evolved, so as to serve the interests of the ruling class, which is, for example, our, our, uh, our constitutional state. It, it's set up so that there will be you know, a class society, and that's the problem. So the idea is to supersede that with another society, but to use the current structure to help build that. Well, you can imagine this is not a simple maybe, matter. Maybe we could take a minute to ask if there are any questions. And have sure. Go um, ahead. Go ahead. Let's it, talk about the election. If that's okay. Well, there's something else. So, but people seem to uh, to uh, give a, a very optimistic a picture of the revolution. I mean, the wait a minute. First of all, he says it's a revolution. Yeah. yeah. In a sense. What? In, in, in a very gentle way. He's explaining facts of what happened, and you're not calling it a revolution, but it seems to me it truly well, is no a question about it. It I also think. seems to me that it is a type of socialism. It's frankly socialism. It's a socialist government, just like the Cubans openly would say that their government is socialist. OK, so my, I have a couple of questions. One, um, one is from a, a US point of view. What you're talking about in the Constitution of Venezuela, as I, I think, is a type of uh, government which guarantees a positive sense of human rights. Yes. In other words, the government provides you or makes certain that you have economic rights. That's something our Constitution does not have. Our Constitution is not at all built on economic rights. For instance, it guarantees nothing like housing. It guarantees not medical care or education. It does guarantee, though, a type of negative liberty, which I'll bet you that does not occur in Venezuela. And by that, I mean uh, liberty from the government. Our whole Bill of Rights is based on freedom from the government. Our Bill of Rights, which says we have free speech, free expression of religion, uh, without government interference. That's a type of negative liberty that, frankly, I think Americans value. I value that, too. In a country, though, like uh, Venezuela, I'm not certain that they have that notion of negative liberty. But they do have positive liberty. In other words, their government, at least under Chavez, guaranteed housing, medical care, education. I think that's a key difference between the United States and many of the other Latin American republics. But in Venezuela, the people yeah. participate in the, the well, this is not like- He didn't like, say that. I mean, the, the communes, I mean, the, the everybody behind, uh, the, I mean, the Chavista, they, they are, the government that, I mean, the country that uh, Hugo Chavez was dreaming about is where, like, the country belongs to you also. It's your government. You're you saying the country. Yeah. In, okay, and I believe that, what he's saying, and I appreciate that. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that the United States does not have that kind of positive view even of the government. I don't think it should have either, frankly. But they don't have, they have the idea that government means tyranny. And I think that's the difference between the United States probably and any, almost any other government in the world. And, uh, and because we came out of a different revolutionary era. We were in the 18th century revolution when monarchy was viewed as tyranny, right? So our constitution developed in a different fashion than what he's talking about. I'm not putting any value on it, except that I support the Bill of Rights. But I'm not necessarily putting out value on it. I'm just saying that that 
those two kind of constitutions are different, that's all. I'm just yeah. letting everybody decide themselves if it's valuable or not. However, I think the minute that, that any country talk, starts to talk away the, the, in the way that people from Venezuela talk, that the United States totally freaks out. They yeah. freak yeah. out about socialism. Yeah. I think that's the basis of our politics since, frankly, since 1917, when the Bolsheviks took over Russia. I still think that the United States, because it's a capitalist country, cannot stand the notion of socialism, and it has formed our pol foreign policy ever since. I think what, what you're saying is absolutely true. I, I, I don't think there's any question about uh, rights to free, uh, to free speech and so forth right. in Venezuela. Is anyway. there, though? Well, I, you know, I'll tell you. Uh, it would be hard to say that there was any kind of repression and free, of free speech in Venezuela if you just look no, at the No, but I'm not asking that. Is no. that in the Constitution? Uh, and then the uh, problem also is that wait a minute, you know, wait a minute, let the revolution yeah. was not done. You know, you have like adversity from wait other countries like the US. Yeah, yeah, just like it's going to, we're getting there. But I just wanted to say that, you know, the way we look at uh, the, uh, the movement in Venezuela, we don't see the reaction of the US and the Western world. So we just see that they're repressing people, they, you know, but we don't see that is as a result also of so much pressure on the government. You know, I mean, the, the country has never been at peace. If we had Hugo Chavez yeah. Yeah. go all the way to what he wanted to do, maybe in this process there would have been, you know, more you know, liberties. But if you have to, every day, you don't know if like the neighbor or the guy who is cutting the grass for the president is being sent by the CIA. You, you kind of, it's the same thing happened with uh, Mugabe in, 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 in uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Mugabe was a good boy for the Western world until he decided to organize this uh, agricultural reform, giving back the land to the, the so, so it's not maybe, uh, it's not easy to say that there's no freedom of speech over there without taking the context of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really, I, this is all very abstract because, yeah. to frankly, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a I, I'm not an expert on the Constitution. And Which so, one? Uh, the Venezuelan Venezuela, Venezuela, yeah. Constitution. Well, either one, really. Yeah, right, I'm, right, I'm not right. an expert. I've right. lived under one of them for a long time. And I've read through the, a good deal of the Constitution. It's quite a long uh, thing, actually. Of it, um, and I, w there's not a Bill of Rights in the same right, sense, right. which was tacked on to our Constitution anyway. Right. But the, the, uh, the guarantees for, for such all of such things are, are all implicit in there. And they're care it, it, whether or not they're even in the Constitution, the, the question of, it, it would be a joke to say for anyone, I mean, I know they say this sort of thing in the, in the propaganda outfits here, that there's uh, repression and so forth. But frankly, anyone who was actually experienced or paid attention to Venezuela can see that, that the ability to criticize the government is allowed to levels that are kind of unbelievable. Um, I mean, for example, people like uh, uh, Maria Corina Machado, they, they uh, and uh, other other leaders in the in the in the opposition have done things and and promoted things that are uh, outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a coup for one thing. Most of the people in the, that were involved in the coup got away scot free, frankly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chavez was incredibly lenient. In fact, a lot of, he had a lot of uh, flack from mm -hmm. his own supporters that he really didn't come down hard on them. But you know, he 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 just simply didn't. And there was a he was really criticized severely in Venezuela by by the people who had suffered a lot from that coup and from the and from the uh, lockout afterwards. But no, he he insisted. Look. We're all Venezuelans, they have different opinions, and yeah, they did a lot of bad things, but um, they did not go to jail, uh, mm -hmm. most of them. A few people who did really, you know, just plan out murder and stuff, I mean, they did, but uh, uh, most most of them just, I mean, they, really, they lost their jobs. <laughs> a lot of the people in the oil company who sailed the ships out, those ships, sea captains were out of a job as a sea captain, you know, but, um, 
that's what happened basically. And right and all right right now, right up to the, the, this current election, mm. um, the stuff that was was is being done uh, it almost constantly uh, throughout the entire historical period has been people may, said doing and saying outrageous things, trying openly trying to organize insurrections, literally openly organize and. and and, and getting it just as far as they got in 2002, but in other cases too, or, or, or in organizing insurrections, um, uh, saying whatever they want to say, mm -hmm. with virtually no consequences, uh, apart from being blocked from carrying on. And this is the it's the it's the the attitude of a government that feels secure in in its base, mm -hmm. that they they have the majority of people solidly behind them and they can allow that to happen. And believe me, if you follow what's being said and done, the attacks, the verbal and, 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 and slanderous attacks on, on Venezuelan officials and, and government, to any, any question that there's not, not freedom of speech or freedom of activity of that sort, which is just simply absurd, is it's not so. Okay, did you have a question here? Sure. Okay. If I could go back to Simon Bolivar, yeah. but briefly, because I, what I know about him is from reading books by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and what I learned from that was that Colombia and Venezuela were really one country at that time that Bolivar was fighting for, a, for a, really for South American unity, but against the colonial powers of Europe. And, and that was a success, as, as I understand it. I mean, South America throughout the colonial powers, uh, as Sandy was saying, got, it sort of got replaced by a um, strong influence a policy influence from the United States to dominate South America. Um, but specifically, I, Simon Bolivar, he operated from a united country, which was Colombia and Venezuela at the time. So, so that, coming now to the present day, there's a lot of antagonism that between those two countries, evidently. This, that sense yeah. of unity has is, is gone completely. But, uh, you know, um, Colombia has been through its own civil war and struggles between, it's a kind of a class struggle, I think. And uh, so what, can you say anything about the relationship between the struggle for power and democracy and, and, and um, equality in, in Colombia relative to what has been happening in Venezuela, and why there's such a, apparently such a sharp um, boundary between those two countries. Well, okay, uh, after after Bolivar finally and, and others too, of course, um, managed to uh, get rid of the Spaniards. They formed a country. It was it included uh, Venezuela. Colombia and Ecuador. So uh, yeah, the three were all, um, you can see it in their flags and all the rest of it now. They were all one country, but it lasted just a little while. Mm -hmm. Because uh, basically the local uh, ruling classes um, fell to squabbling over who was gonna be you know, in charge and all the rest of the things that ruling classes from different areas can get squabbling about. And finally, um, they turned against Bolivar, who kept trying to pull them together. And also, Bolivar did another thing, too. He was very much against slavery. And he was, <coughs> he was very much of a liberate, liberator, liber, libertador, they called him. And he was a liberator in, in that regard, too. Um, they fell apart, and the three countries were separated very, very soon. <coughs> um, but Bolivar uh, finally ended up completely disillusioned. He he was he, there were assassination attempts made against him. He'd been thrown out of Venezuela. He was going to go and live in Europe. He 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 he. Uh, he, there was a famous phrase that he felt that, that anyone who was trying, he said, in fact, it was a quote, I can't quote it exactly, but that anybody who was trying who try, who try, try to do what he was doing was plowing the seed. That was his famous idea. He felt that he'd been plowing the sea, uh, that it, nothing had changed, and he was just, he finally died from tuberculosis after an, an, an assassination attempt was made, and uh, he, he, he had spent the night hiding under a bridge, and, and 
he had terrible um, uh, tuberculosis, actually, all his, most of his life. Uh, he died at a relatively young age um, after un unbelievable feats, actually. Uh, but now, so what's the relationship? Uh, uh, so they, they were broken up into different. Now, nowadays, Colombia over the years became a, um, a taken over by uh, a, a narco dictatorship, essentially. Um, and for the last several decade, decades, the nar narcotics, uh, uh, Uribe, who, uh, uh, the president of Uribe, for example, um, he was uh, uh, a lawyer for the narco uh, uh, in, his, in his town, uh, and he emerged as a president. Um, he worked closely with the, with the CIA and, and, and all of their, and the DEA, and all of their dealings with, with the drug business. Um, and. Uh, uh, the, the country was basically became a, 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 a really a puppet of the United States. Um, they, there are I, I've forgotten now. It was six bases at one point. I'm not sure how many bases they have now. But there, there's a, a military, a U.S. military, is all over the place, um, and uh, uh, the uh, there have been um, uh, two major. Um, uh, Two major upper, uh, organizations that uh, the, uh, the uh, ELN and, uh, and the and the uh, FARC um, were in rebellion for years. They signed various peace agreements and so on. But if you look at it, uh, uh, Garcia Marquez uh, in, in some of his novels, well, for one, he, he had a novel about what the, the, the general in his labyrinth was just about, the end, last days of Bolivar and, and how, how uh, the, you know, was the sad story of his final end. But uh, in his other ones, you, you see the, the, the constant um, Civil War going on in in in, uh, 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 in Colombia, and it's, it's sort of symbolized by in a uh, uh, hundred years of solitude. You know, there, there's a lot of politics in that that aren't obvious uh, to the casual novel reader, but there's a lot of politics in there, and it's about the the, the left and the right uh, alternating in power, uh, having bitter bitter civil wars going on constantly, and finally it got resolved. It kind of got it evolved into the narco dictatorship deeply in collusion. We were like the, the Colombia became like the Israel of, of South America, a client state run by gangsters. Um, now, finally, there was a, 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 a I, I have not followed Colombia anywhere near as close as, as Venezuela. My understanding of Colombia is very superficial, in, in, you know, because it's, it's a different country, and I just, I, um. I've only passed through, okay. but I can say that, 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 it's, that what you're asking about is why are they so different? Well, because one of them has historically been, an, and still is in many ways, very much by, uh, ruled by, by, through, from Washington. Uh, Petro is, is going against the grain, and right now he's being threatened with being, with the kind of lawfare, the same kind of thing that they are trying all over the place using uh, different legal tricks mm -hmm. to finally isolate. And there's all kinds of, I can give you plenty of examples, what's happened to Pedro, I, oh, I can't think of his name now, in, in uh, Peru and so forth, where they use legal tricks to get, to bring down a president who is progressive. And they're trying that in Colombia now. Um, but anyway, it's kind of getting late in the evening, so maybe the, this whole idea of Latin America and U.S. foreign policy would, should be really maybe the subject of another program almost. But before we leave, I just wanted to ask, or at least talk a little bit about the whole idea of why is the United States so afraid of countries like Venezuela? Why, for instance, do we call into question the last uh, election so much, which elected Maduro again, um, again, a follower of Chavez, a follower of this notion of revolution in uh, Venezuela, of the building up of a communal movement, as Peter would say. 
And I think uh, that that whole discussion should be held, and I'm not certain that we really have time. But I will mention that it, this policy of the United States in control of all of Latin America, and maybe all of the world, but particularly of Latin America, occurred in 1823 with what we all know of as the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine clearly set out reasons or the search for American dominance in all of Latin America. And it said, essentially, that the United States, as the hegemonic power in the region, was never going to let any other power come in to Latin, all of Latin America and control Latin America, that henceforth, the United States would be in control of all of Latin America. And that would be also militarily, economically in particular. It was almost as if the Anglo-Americans were going to control all of Latin America for the interests of the Anglo-Americans and the elites of this country. It's a whole foreign policy discussion that I think we probably should reserve for another day, but it seems to me that is why the recent election results in Venezuela, which elected once again President Maduro, it seems like the United States can't stand it and that it has disputed those election results and has sought to put somebody else in place, essentially. First Guaido, correct? Yep. And then now somebody else. It seems like the United States cannot stand any of the Latin American Republican republics going their own way. I want to just tell you, read something that, or, or a translation of something I actually first saw in a, on a subway station in, in Caracas. Uh, it's a quote from Bolivar, and uh, Bolivar said that um, the United States is, is uh, it seems that the United States is destined by providence to plague Latin America with misery in the name of liberty. Yeah. And the, the United States, even before the Monroe Doctrine, uh, another famous, uh, in, in famous in, in Latin America, uh, Francisco Miranda. He, he, Miranda was co coming to the. He was trying to get uh, get a rebel, rebellion going, mm -hmm. trying to get arms. He was going to the United States, and the United States, oh no, we we we're neutral. Uh, Who they were the United States was it the president the, the, the United States government. They wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't help. They, but they were selling arms to um, to Spain. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, but that's just between us governments here, you know. But we're not going to get involved in rebellion. Mm -hmm. In other words, they came. The Venezuela soon came to the conclusion that what they were doing was leaving it in up to the Spaniards to deal with them, because they knew that this that this eventually. The, the fruit would fall from the tree, and they wanted to be there to catch it. Right. But that was the idea, to let, let the Spaniards have Latin America until we're ready to take to swallow it up. And they almost did take Cuba. I mean, they, 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 were, right, they, uh, right. you know, right. they almost uh, annexed it, but then they fortunately did you know, I, I think I have a Is there a, a chance that uh, Venezuela could f uh, uh, ex experience uh, uh, a change of power, even yes. in peace. Yes. It's or very are we going to to see the uh, the uh, Venezuela, the Venezuela of Maduro and Chavez stay forever? What are the chances to have? <laughs> You're asking me. <laughs> no, there's definitely a chance, and, and and there's a chance that there could be an invasion. And, and yeah. I, uh, to, but frankly, as pa uh, pa General Padrino just actually said. He's very. He didn't say a lot, uh, but he said, uh, "He said we're we're not unarmed." That was wow. what he said. Mm. We are not unarmed. They have S three hundreds. Maybe I don't know if they have S four hundred uh, anti aircraft systems from from Russia. But the Russians supplied them with it a few years ago with the best anti aircraft uh, or anti missile defense in the world, which it continues to be. Uh, they have the best, and they have a lot of things from other places. They're ready. Um, Venezuela is also um, has. A, it's a very interesting. The the, the army. Um, Chavez did this right off. Uh, he, he called it Plan Bolivar, to, to have the army integrate with 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 the population. 
Um, one of the different things, see, in, in other Latin countries, there's a military caste amongst the, uh, the, the upper classes. They guarantee that they're in charge of all the, the, the generalships and, and the higher. Uh, they, they go to school in military school. They send their kids. Uh, Venezuela, they don't do that. They, they send their kids to, to Miami. Uh, instead of military school, and they just left the army to be, yeah, just recruit people. We'll, we'll, we'll co-opt them once they get to be generals, so we'll just take them in. And, and that always worked up to a, a, a point until people like Chavez started getting in. Uh, the, the Venezuelan army, including the officer class, is made, are brown people. They have brown skins. This is nothing. The officer class is in Chile, for example. Which white? Um, is, and, and Argentina and so on. They're white. But not in, in, in uh, Venezuela, the, the army is brown. And uh, I mean, the whole question of race and. Always been like this, or since. Uh, uh, no, uh, they were before, before Chavez, too. I mean, see, the upper class in Venezuela, they were too. They, they, they weren't interested in that. They, they didn't. They, they didn't. There weren't families that, that proudly sent their boys off to be. You know, to, to end up in the military academy and be the, be the generals and the fly boys and all of that stuff. It's like, yeah, that, never mind. We'll, we'll hire somebody to do that. And the, they were quite confident, and it worked too. That once a, once a, a, a guy from the barrios became a general, he was already well into the system. You know, so that there are some brown faces on, on the east end of Caracas too, because you know they co-opted people. But the, the army there is different. And that is a, a real interesting factor. Another thing that's interesting about uh, Venezuela in, in, those re in that regard is a militia. I was really amazed to see that more recently uh, the, in, in, in visits there that the, usually a demonstration is like a sea of red. And it, it'll go down the street where you can't even see anymore. They're all in red shirts, everybody. There was one little party called Patria para todos, the, uh, the party of everybody that wore blue shirts, and they were always a little contingent in the demonstration. They were all chavistas, but they were blue, but otherwise red. But now you see big masses of khaki, and when you look closer, well, for one thing, the people in those demonstrations. I, I actually, the last time I was there in a big demonstration, I looked very carefully. I couldn't find a single white face, actually. Uh, a, a real, really surely white European face. It was all at least mestizo of some sort, but generally brown, brown people. Uh, but these people in khaki uniforms were of all ages. And I was very, I really went, went out of my way to talk to a few of them because, like, they were my age. I, had to look, I was younger than a little bit. Uh, but people in their 70s, even, along with all kinds of other people. And also women, too. Many, many old women dressed in these uniforms. But this was the militia. And the militia is a, a, a voluntary thing. Mm -hmm. And there are people in arms training. I, I talked to one guy, and he said, Yeah, you know how to uh, do, use a, a Kalashnikov. But the arms are all locked up, but they're all over the countryside. The, 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 the local folks are, have arms. If they were kind of, there, there's no revolution going to come from them because the government, they're with the government. But the, the, uh, this militia does a lot of other stuff, like help deliver their right. food to people so, and, and just kind of do things in an organized way. And they're there to defend that revolution. So it, that's one of the reasons that they can't just send in the Marines. It would be a bitter fight like no other. It would be much worse than Afghanistan in terms of fighting the population who would never give up, I think. Not those people. The, the upper classes, though, they, they're, they're, they, Karina, uh, uh, okay. Marty Cody, she's actually requested not only the United States to go to an invade, but, but they, she asked, asked the, the, a few years ago, she asked whether the Israelis couldn't send over some people and, and straighten things out. Because you know, she figured that they would be able, they would be hard, hard enough to, tough enough to do it. Uh, and that's, they're really extreme right wingers. They're, uh, it's really a fascist movement, but it's a, it's a, a pretty well established fascist movement. And I, I use the word advisedly. I, I, I'm not just trying to use a, a pejorative term, but they, they're very much in connection with fascist movements all over, and in, in, including Zionism, of course. But um, the, uh, the, their program is really to uh, uh, to get the, the child, not just to get the Chavistas out, but to get them in jail and get them to the firing squads. 
Um, and they, what they did with the, when they uh, took, did briefly in that 47 hour period of, of Pedro the Brief, um, they, uh, that's what they were starting to do. Um, they're, they're a really mean gun bunch, and I think uh, the Venezuelans are very well aware of that, that they're working yeah. class Venezuelans. But anyway, so I think that any final questions or comments or? I think you do a whole show on the election. I don't think we talked about it at all. And, uh, we talked a lot about what happened yeah. 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. What happened 15 months ago? I know. And I don't think I'd answer that now. But no, no, show we shouldn't. It's getting too late. Yeah, but I think show, it, yes. just talk about that, not the, not the history. I, but I, the I'd love to, actually. Yeah, uh, sure. But a philosophical but, question between the Democrats and the Republicans. Oh, come on. Who this, have been like uh, he, more come on, open to uh, to, uh, to deal better with Venezuela. Oh, no, we don't no, have come to. Come on. No, Sandy, let me ask my question. Oh, okay. Okay. Very, no, it's too late. Yeah, yeah but uh, we'd end up with this. No, 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 let me just read a little <laughs> quote. It's from, from Obama. Um, in uh, um, Obama, in, let's see if I can find it here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I can't. Okay. To, to Obama only... in 1915, uh, 2015, uh, started a new round uh, uh, of really seriously bearing down, and Bear with down. hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, uh, the the sanctions the sanctions are meant explicitly and openly to induce as much suffering and as much unnecessary deaths and sickness as possible in Venezuela. The theory being they'll rise up and, and overthrow the Chavistas and it's not working. It's not working. No, but what, what Eric said is really important. That's why I mentioned the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine has been supported by both parties yes, in right the right. United States right. since the beginning of time. So, so is uh, Venezuela going to be, uh, <laughs> in these elections, a topic very important? We'll see. No. Because there's no. My, no, no, not no, necessarily. No. They're united. Uh, yeah, yeah. They're all, they're they're all, all, they all want it. All right, that's uh, on the... <laughs> the auspices of this un unity of the U.S. Yeah. You know, the, political the class. The ruling class of the United States, States is quite unified. Yeah. And, but, yeah I, in I, terms of foreign policy. And in solidarity with the yeah. former ruling class of... Uh, I, I, I want to just make one comment about the elections, and that is... Which ones? The, in Venezuela. Yeah. That they, but they're, they're, it's exactly like Trump. Um, ever since the very beginning, whenever they lose, they say the same thing. Um, when they think that a, a few times, the government came up with this idea that was so hard to with you. The this has been going on. Well, every single election, if they don't win, they, once in a while they win an election, they won a couple. They, and they just, uh, the government said, okay, you won that election, fine, that's the way it is. Um, but whenever they lose, they say the same thing. Well, but what, what's really just galling to see the, the, it taken seriously here is the claim that, that the uh, opposition won 78%. Yeah. That's like as if Trump said, I won, I not only won the election, but I won by 78%. Hey, can it's I say something? So it's it's, it's just insulting. It's insulting to the intelligence. But let me it's tell you. But, but, again, but again, Peter, I, I guess a long discussion. But in this country, it's both parties who say stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Trump say it too that they didn't really lose. Hillary Clinton, Clinton yeah. says it all the time. Nice. So please, please, <laughs> so, it's, it's so true of American. America's politics right now. I, th I think the, the, the real... But Trump was yeah, uh, quite a, never, a, a okay. good enemy of Venezuela because I see a Absolutely. lot of... Uh, yeah. yeah, but Peter yeah. just mentioned Obama was too. No, I, they're, 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 they're no there's no... There, it's a complete unity between the right. parties. But I think that the, the whole question... I, I, it, the idea that... <clears throat> that the, the, Given the track record of the Venezuelan opposition, yeah. given the fact that the claims that they're making so are so absurd, the, and it, it's, um, it's even if, uh, uh, ahead of time, there's only one, there's actually two, but there's one, one really big polling firm in Latin America called Interlaces. And uh -huh, uh, yeah. it's spelled with an H, hit their losses. But anyway, that's the, the, one, uh, the only one that's really, because you can buy polls, as you well know, yeah. to say whatever you want to say. You just pay them and they give you the poll results. But Interlaces is independent and respected, and they predicted almost exactly what, yeah. what the right. government said. 
<clears throat> it, that's, it, it, that's just the way it was. But the bullshit that comes with, if you excuse my language, but it's just, and the, the thing that's most distressing is that our press, yeah. our liberal press, right, exactly. our NPR, our New York Times, all the rest, of, and throughout the Western world, because this is not confined to the United States, mm -hmm. the Latin press too, they, they, it's unified, it's completely, it's a straight line. They all say the same thing, and they actually collude that way. There was a Venezuelan editor actually went to a, a big meeting of all the Latin big news, big big newspapers who have you know big circulation, like 50 or so. And, uh, this was back in the in the Guarima days when they were having riots in the in the 2014 or thereabouts, uh, if I have my dates right. But uh, when he went, but he, when he came back, he, he actually published in his newspaper, he was an honest guy, he died recently, he was a very well respected journalist. He, he exposed that they had agreed, all of these newspapers, that every single day they would run a negative story about Venezuela and, and, uh, and the revolution there. That it was like, a, he said, his, what he said was, even in the days of Hitler, they never did this kind of thing. <laughs> but they have got, they are so, <clears throat> it's just like pure propaganda. It's like campaign that goes on and on and on of, di of, dis of disrespect and lies about Venezuela. I see it every day and I, I checked it, uh, I, I checked the, cur the current press here. It's hard to watch, to read. It's hard to see people being lied to and people around me. Right. You know, yeah, that's why. That's all again. Yeah. Just that's exactly the story. Thank you very much, Peter. That's why we had, we had you yeah. here, so that we could better understand why the U.S. You know, feels threatened by, uh, by Venezuela. Uh, thank you so much for watching us through um, CCTV Channel 17, our partner. Uh, on this uh, uh, series of, uh, of uh, uh, speech, I mean, talks on uh, public affairs. Sandy, thank you so much for having been here. Peter, uh, I think we have to continue that discussion. Yes. Yeah, I, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about that. Do we continue? Thank you so much. Yeah.